Hello there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Star Wars fans, we're a divisive bunch. It's hard to please us, and it's even harder to introduce new characters and concepts that we'll approve of. But there's one element of Star Wars that's always been universally loved, and it appears in almost every entry of the series, whether it be films, TV, books, or comics. We, of course, are talking about the droid companion. Every great Star Wars character has one. Anakin Skywalker had R2-D2 and C-3PO, Hera Syndulla has Chopper, and Poe Dameron had BB-8. Then there's Cassian Andor's K-2SO, then Snap Wexley's murdering Mr. Bones. Din Djarin tolerated IG-12, and Iden Versio had ID-10. Cal Kessis had BD-1, and people even liked Dr. Aphra's psychotic version of R2-D2 and C-3PO in BT-1 and Triple Zero. As a matter of fact, the only droid I remember people hating on was L-337. And people's biggest complaint towards her was her activism. In a lot of ways, I think our biggest problem was that she was a bit too human, and it kind of ruined the illusion. But the point is, there is clearly an appetite for droid companions, even in this world right here. And what makes them appealing? Well, it's the fact that despite looking like a toaster, they exhibit human-like behavior and thought. They're interesting to talk to. Some also become quite emotional and develop quirky personalities, especially if they haven't had their memory banks wiped for a while. There's also an obedience factor. The droids, despite being intelligent and seemingly sentient, choose to follow their human masters without much concern for their own well-being. Droids are basically a machine with human intelligence, but dog-like personality and loyalty. And if you look like dog, it is dog. Droids are basically man's best friend. Better yet, they'll outlive us all, so we'll never have to feel that pain of watching them go before us. Which I believe is the real reason why George Lucas made Wookiees live up to 400 years old in Star Wars. Ultimately, all of Star Wars is an attempt by George Lucas to deal with the mortality of his own beloved pup, an Alaskan Malamut named Indiana. Okay, that's completely a conjecture, but boy were fans pissed when the Yuzang Vong dropped an entire moon on Chewie's head in Legends, killing him. Anyway, in today's video, I wanna take a look at just how close we are to making actual droids come alive. Now, clearly the mechanical parts of a droid are pretty easy to make. Uh, you know, we have Boston Dynamics and Tesla to thank. And even the battery technology is starting to get there. The batteries are smaller, lighter, more efficient, more powerful. The most difficult part of making droids come alive, of course, is their brain. We have to create uh, artificial general intelligence. And so today I thought it'd be cool to look at the state of machine learning in today's world. And I wanna take a look at one specific powerful statistical uh, language model known as ChatGPT. So yeah, how close is humanity to reaching the holy grail of artificial general intelligence or human-like intelligence in a machine that has the capability to learn and self-teach. Now, a lot of social media pages and media companies will bombard you with really sensational headlines. Unfortunately, a lot of people who write these things they don't really understand what's going on. They're probably just reading press releases and just regurgitating the marketing from these companies. Like, check this out. Open AI is reportedly close to an AI breakthrough that could threaten humanity. And then you have the subheading, Open AI might be close to achieving an artificial general intelligence breakthrough. But here's the thing. If you actually ask experts in the field, not the marketing individuals, not the uh, so-called idea guys who aren't on the technical side, if you ask them how close we are to artificial general intelligence, people are very divided on this subject matter. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't even know exactly what artificial general intelligence means, how we can identify it, how we can test it. And so that is the beginning of the problem. What the hell is machine consciousness? And can we achieve it? I mean, we're not even sure what makes a human conscious. You can map out all the human brain and neural networks, but how all these connections create that spark that exists in you, me, and in R2-D2 is still a complete mystery. We're not even sure what field is going to solve this problem. Is this gonna be a psychology thing, a philosophy thing, physics, neuroscience, cognitive science, biology, mathematics, computer science? It's hard enough to invent a new technology. It's even harder when you don't even know what that technology is supposed to look like. Take a company like OpenAI. It recently had some controversy as members of the board tried to put bricks on Sam Altman, the CEO's work in AI research. And when he refused, he was fired. You see, on the board of directors for OpenAI, you do have a lot of academics and scientists, and they were concerned about the the ethics of continuing to pursue AI research and trying to monetize it before understanding what the societal impacts are. And there are clearly going to be a lot of societal impacts. These individuals were basically the last line of defense holding Sam Altman and his brazen attempts to chase profits and monetize the technology his company is developing. And during this attempt to remove Sam Altman, the entire company, most of the people who worked there, actually sided 
with their CEO, Sam Altman. And don't for a second believe it's because Sam Altman is a visionary or creating something spectacular. That's complete BS. It has a lot more to do with the fact that OpenAI employees get equity or you know shares of the company. And so Sam Altman's less conservative approach to monetizing this project is something that the company really wants. Like all tech CEOs, like how Google used to tell its employees do no evil, Sam Altman has changed as well. Gone are his more idealistic views of AI and deep learning and how it could completely change the world and make life much easier for so many people, something I still believe in. And in its place is Sam Altman, uh, tech boy. I'm not against profits, I'm not against capitalism. I think it's a flawed, but a really good system and you need to regulate it. You need to put checks and balances on it so you don't destroy the consumer class because then no one wins. But I am against snake oil salesmen. I'm against profit at all costs. And I'm afraid that Sam Bankman, uh, sorry, Sam Altman is just like all these other tech boys. And I'm so tired of their fake spirituality and God complexes and massive views of the world when at the end they're just creating some type of subpar product that's designed purely to make money. And let's be honest, OpenAI, thanks to ChatGPT and its many applications, uh, has a lot of brand recognition. I mean, if you wanted to IPO ChatGPT, I mean, I'm not one to speculate, but I'm sure it would do a lot better than all the other IPOs this year, you know. ChatGPT is truly amazing. I mean, forget SparkNotes, just ask ChatGPT to produce a five paragraph essay that summarizes the various themes of the Scarlet Pimpernel. There are actually plenty of ChatGPT spinoffs that do all sorts of crazy things. I mean, you could even have a companion chat love bot that you can talk to if you're lonely. I'm not judging you, it's just, it is out there, so hey. But the problem is a lot of people are beginning to think that ChatGPT is actually learning and providing answers that have meaning. Some people might be pointing at the screen, screaming that the Terminators are here. But what we're actually seeing with ChatGPT is a very, very, very powerful parlor trick that is not all that different from those elephants that paint paintings, right? You might have seen documentaries or social media clips that show elephants using their trunks to paint simple pictures. Add in a David Attenborough sounding narrator who extols the intelligence of these majestic beasts. And you might think that elephants have the same abilities to draw as human toddlers. But here's the thing, toddlers are awesome, humans are awesome. And frankly, we are better than every other animal on this planet. And that's because we have the ability to see and to copy and to eventually create and modify. When we draw a picture, we do it with intent, fully visualizing what the end product is. That's also why I consider a good amount of abstract art and conceptual art, especially the performative conceptual stuff, just another fancy way to launder money as opposed to actual good art. But yeah, back to the elephant painters. They're even less talented than the Yoko Onos of the world. They actually aren't drawing. Instead, trainers force them to repeat the same motions over and over again with the brush until they're basically printing out paintings like a copy machine. It's a shortcut, one that can be really misleading. If you don't really understand what's going, you might be going home and saying, hey man, we should buy a bunch of elephants and try to like sell their work in galleries. You know, if we get someone stupid enough to buy one, maybe we can bump up the price, right? And uh, you know, ChatGPT in a lot of ways functions just like that elephant who's painting. And that's because ChatGPT is not really using intelligence when it produces its results. Intelligence implies the ability to take in information, process it, and learn and create from it. What ChatGPT is, is not an AI. We should never call ChatGPT an AI. Marketing as such is wrong. What it really is, is a uh, very advanced version of a statistical language model, something that's been around for quite some time. I mean, you guys remember that little paperclip guy from Microsoft Word back in the day, right? Or every time you use your smartphone and it just auto-corrects for you the word or the grammar? That's actually not intelligence at all. It's just grammar rules, statistics, and data analysis. And the technology that ChatGPT uses, deep uh, learning, is also just a mimicry of human intelligence. And it's actually been around for quite some time and it's only recently been possible thanks to a big increase in processing power that continues to grow at an exponential rate. Despite some setbacks from, you know, chip makers like Intel, the supply chain issues, the more uh, Moore's law is still relevant today. The other technology that ChatGPT relies on is social media and the internet, which since the early 2000s has been a place where human beings have continuously dumped their ideas and thoughts for the world to see. And so to figure out how to realistically reply to questions, it just finds other very similar questions, look at those answers, and then it just kind of takes all those answers, combines them together, and regurgitates its own natural answer, which isn't natural at all. ChatGPT does not understand what it's saying. It's just copying and pasting. It's 
basically rote memorization, something that ChatGPT can do far better than the average human being. This is why ChatGPT can pass the bar exam. It's difficult for humans, not so difficult for something with a massive memory bank that can be easily accessed. It might even do well on the writing section of the SATs as long as it has access to similar essay questions, right? Now, clearly Sam Altman and his guys over at OpenAI are a million times more intelligent than me. But the idea of deep learning has been around for decades. I mean, it's not necessarily new technology. And then this statistical language model, while impressive, is not AGI. And I think maybe Sam Altman realizes that it's not really possible to create AGI. And so he's trying to cash in now or maybe raise more funds for the future for another push. It's always been a continuous battle. Before deep learning, we had Watson from IBM, whose own lineage goes all the way back to the supercomputer known as Deep Blue, who in 1996 beat chess grandmaster Garry Kasparov in a match. Back then it was said that once a machine beats someone in chess, that's it guys, Terminator's gonna be walking around on the streets. And they're always wrong when they say stuff like this. The funny thing is a few decades later, now we have the equivalent of deep blue on our smartphones. And furthermore, it took supercomputers two more decades to be able to beat humans at the game Go, which is far more complex than chess. This was Google's DeepMind Units AlphaGo program. Elon Musk and Altman actually formed OpenAI specifically to challenge Google's powerful lead in the AI industry. But here's the thing, if you actually ask ChatGPT to solve a problem, a problem that maybe has not been solved on the internet, it begins to struggle, even if that question is very, very simple. For instance, if I tell ChatGPT to solve this very simple Sudoku puzzle, I mean, it's only, what, four across? It gives me an extremely confident explanation on how to solve the puzzle, which I'm sure I lifted from another guide on Sudoku, and then it proceeds to get this very simple puzzle completely wrong with a lot of confidence. ChatGPT, in a lot of ways, is just pure computing power. It's kind of like how the First Order was able to track the resistance down. It wasn't by using some type of smart technology. It was a supercomputer that had access to all star charts and navigation logs. It predicted where people could jump within reasonable accuracy because it had so much computing power and was able to run so many different models. I actually thought that was a really cool detail in uh, that movie. And it kind of showcases just how stubborn and kind of, you know, st stupid the First Order was. They had this tendency to use brute strength to solve all of their problems. But ask that same First Order supercomputer where you left your keys and it won't know what to do. That is the limitation of these things that mimic intelligence. And while ChatGPT can pretend to have a conversation with you about the meaning of life, it's really just regurgitating other people's ideas. It's fun to use, but does it provide actual value I mean, not really if you can read yourself and look at the source materials. And that's why ChatGPT can't solve the simplest of puzzles if it hasn't already seen someone else solve it. And I'll tell you, you know, this is something that a 10 year old could easily solve. And that's because the 10 year old is actually sentient. Just like the droids in Star Wars, who yes, have trillions upon trillions of lines of binary code, but somehow that code magically, and let me emphasize magic, because with our current state of understanding of AGI, it might as well be magic. As a matter of fact, out of all of the crazy technologies that humans have been saying is only a few decades away, I think very ambitious projects like fusion reactors and the colonization of Mars will happen before there will be true AGI walking on Earth. You know, when K2SO decided to sacrifice his life for Cassian Andor during the Scarif raid, in the novelization of Rogue One, we see the thought process going through the old security bot's head. He actually runs several simulations on how he can save himself, his friend Cassian, and also the mission. He quickly realizes that there was only one way to do things, and that was to save the mission. Both of their lives were forfeited. This is statistical analysis, and it's not hard necessarily for a computer to be better at this than a human being, but what makes K2SO so human is the fact that in the last second before he dies, he runs a completely unnecessary simulation in which Cassian Andor does survive, and it fills him with a moment of joy. It's emotional, it's irrational, and it is very human. Now, having said that, we still don't really understand what human consciousness is, where it comes from, what part of the what part of the brain you have to hit to disable it. But things like ChatGPT are a cheap mimicry of the human mind. It is snake oil, in my opinion, and unfortunately, just a flash in the pan. Now, having said all this, uh, you know, I'm not saying you guys should be a Luddite and not use ChatGPT or the various other chat bots that are out there. I actually think these uh, chatbots are great tools that can really help you do research, even write stuff. I mean, I think the ethics of that is a little questionable, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, like, 
the best way to interact with new technology is not to fear. There's so many people out there in the world who want you to fear technology. Like, let's hate EV cars because they're just different. Let's hate, uh, you know, green energy because it's different. You know, yes, there are a lot of stupid applications for new technology, but it's much better to remove your identity and emotions away from technology and try to understand it and how it can impact the world and yourself. Because if you don't know what's going on in the world, you might fall behind and that'll put you in a really bad situation and you will then be more vulnerable to whatever AI, whatever deep learning will bring to us in the future. And whatever it brings, it's probably not gonna be droids, which I guess is the whole point of this video. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. See you next time.